For those of you who don't know, my name is Adriana and my channel is Perpetual Pages. I am a queer and non-binary Mexican-American reviewer and I'm so pleased to be joined by debut author Kristen Lambert who just came out with her first book yesterday, The Boy in the Red Dress. So welcome Kristen. <laughs> I wanted to ask for those of you who don't know, could you describe what The Boy in the Red Dress is about? The short version is that it's about queer teens solving a mystery um, with their found family and um, it's obviously got murder in it, but yes, yes, but it's more of a fun, lighthearted uh, murder mystery. They call it cozy mystery in adults. Yes. I don't know if there is any cozy mystery <laughs> in way. <YA. laughs> but maybe this will start it. I don't know. That's true. Maybe it's not it's very trend. cozy though. <laughs> I would not call it cozy. No, but it is fun. I wouldn't wear any cozy clothes or anything. <laughs> so before we jump into talking about your book, I did want to ask if you were reading during our session, what were you reading or what were you working on? I read a little bit in this, which Ooh. I have been, I gathered up um, some of my nonfiction books that I read for this as research in case I need to talk about them later. And this was <laughs> Um, um, it's called Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold, and it's about the um, lesbian community in Buffalo, New York, from the 30s to the 60s. And it, you see, I have a lot of no <laughs> sticky notes in it because it really um, gave me a lot of context for what it would have looked like at the club in my club in my book and what it was like for folks living back then. And I love this book. Wow. No, that's interesting. I want to start by asking, you're debuting as an author in a really interesting time where things are changing almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So what has it been like for you to debut a book like this during our current time? And how, if at all, do you feel like you've been impacted by this pandemic as an author? It's been weird, like everything. But um one thing I did want to do on my release day, I always daydreamed about, was going to the bookstore mm -hmm. and seeing my book on the shelf, taking a picture of it, and then my friends going and taking pictures of it at their stores, and you know that whole thing. Yeah. And so obviously that did not happen, mm -hmm. but I did get pictures from my friends getting in the mail and sending me pictures. Mm -hmm. I did miss out on some of the conference things mm -hmm. that were supposed. To, our arc was supposed to be at. Um, Texas Library Association or something mm -hmm. like that, and it got canceled. Everything got canceled, of course. But it actually has been, yesterday was like one of the top three days of my entire life. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. I had, I I realized last night that it felt just like the day that my first child was born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was infertile for several years before I had my kids. And it was like part of me um, suppressed how much I wanted it, how much I wanted a child, how much I wanted to be a mom because it hurt too much, you know? Mm -hmm. So I realized I did the same thing with my book mm -hmm. that it took a long time. It's nine years almost exactly since I really decided this is, I've been wanting to do it forever, but where I actually started actively pursuing it. Mm -hmm. So over the course of nine years, you can't maintain like your, go get them attitude 100% of the time. Right. So I kind of suppressed some way, I think how much I really wanted it. And then yesterday it was like, it's here and now I don't have to pretend anymore. I really freaking wanted this. <laughs> I love that though. I'm glad you got to have that moment because I think you really deserve it. And I, I'm glad you gave us that glimpse into it because yes, it's a long journey to being a published author. So I'm really glad that you got to have that experience. Another, but yes. <laughs> and then so kind of related to that, I wanted to say, I mean, we, we can talk about the challenges and the negative impacts, right, of what we're all going through till we're blue in the face. But I was wondering, is there anything about debuting under these circumstances that has pleasantly surprised you or that you think wouldn't have been possible under different circumstances? Really everything has pleasantly surprised me. There's been so much support from readers and fellow authors because everybody knows it's kind of a mess mm -hmm. and plus people have more time on their hands right now. That's true. <laughs> also, like yesterday my writers group friends and my sister or and my best friend from high school, they organized 
and surprised me and came to my house and we all stood in a giant circle and shouted across it at each other. <laughs> so we had a really distanced launch party since they knew I wasn't getting to have one and um, had cupcakes and everything. So that was a, a very pleasant surprise. And just all the, all the messages of support, people wishing me happy book birthday yesterday, all of it. I mean, it, it could not have been any better if there was no pandemic. I don't wish to change anything. It was wonderful. So I'm glad that's fun. You had like a socially distant launch party. <laughs> that's cute. We love it. We love uh, celebrating yourself. Speaking of your debut, I often find myself really impressed by mystery writers, especially because I think it's one of the hardest genres to pull off because you kind of have to know the end game before you even start and then work your way backwards in a way that's not obvious, but also leaves enough clues to make the payoff seem logical, which is just, that's a landmine. So I commend you for that. So I want to know what are some of the challenges that you came across writing in this genre? I don't want to claim that what I do is harder than what anybody else does. because It's all hard. <laughs> it is. But um, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I always loved mysteries as a kid and always read lots of mysteries. A lot of my favorite books were mysteries. and But I did not realize I was writing a mystery at first. It had mysterious elements, but I had this big epiphany one summer and was like, I am writing a mystery. <laughs> I love mysteries. I'm going to write lots of mysteries. And then um, it changed to a murder and <laughs> the whole thing just went kaboom. And uh, the characters on the setting stayed the same, but the whole plot just went away and I wrote a new one. It really fell into place then once I had that realization that I need to be writing a murder mystery. But also it fell into the wrong place. <laughs> and I had to write it again and again and again. I changed the killer four times. Oh, really? Maybe five oh. times. I don't know. Wow. Um, so maybe other people <laughs> know what they're doing. <laughs> and know the ending and then write it properly, but I did not. So I had to write it several times because Interesting. every time I'd write, I would think, okay, this is the killer. I'll write the whole thing like this is the killer. And then it wouldn't quite feel right. It mm. just kept not feeling right. So I did you know. have to like rewrite like almost the whole thing every time you figured out this person's not really the killer? Kind of, yeah. That is <laughs> awful. It was pitch, war pitch wars in i don't remember what year time is relevant now <laughs> but um i wrote the draft the first draft of it really quick that summer before pitch wars and then rewrote all of it pretty much like 40 percent of it from scratch during pitch wars and then for my first draft for my agent that i got during pitch wars i rewrote again 50 percent of it like just from scratch and then when <laughs> had to do it again i've rewritten the whole thing a lot of times wow <laughs> now i'm like what are the other versions <laughs> but i won't ask that <laughs> that reminds me of a question that noria had come up with and she wanted to know what murder mysteries did you read as a child and how would you say they've influenced your writing of the boy in the red dress i read a lot of nancy drew mysteries when i was little we moved to this we moved a lot and i went to the new town I always that was the first thing i did was wanted to go to the library and see if they had any this place did not have a single nancy drew book it, it was a disaster <laughs> and uh, i mean now you read nancy drew books and i mean these were like the non-racist versions that they, <laughs> out the race stuff. and i've gone back and read the actual racist versions of a couple of them because they were written during the time period that i'm writing and i got some good lingo from them. the old nancy drew was like bitchy <laughs> had her very snarky and um they made her in the, the ones i read as a kid uh, sort of more 1950s like sweet and polite mm. and she was not sweet and polite mm -hmm. in the in the 30s versions but they were super racist so not recommended <laughs> for that I, reason i do like that though. i do feel like that sort of influenced you because i think there is a nice element of like banter and uh snarkiness that is in the story that i really enjoyed so I'm glad that those non-racist versions <laughs> inspired you. <laughs> Moving on, so I feel like your story addresses a very specific niche of YA fiction that you really don't get to see anywhere else. 
because we don't have a ton of queer YA historical murder mysteries out there. So I'm curious to know how you came up with the original idea and what the initial like nugget of inspiration looked like for you. I think nobody knows what to do with this book because <laughs> there aren't a whole lot that fit in the same category. Yeah. Um, I really like most of the young adult mysteries right now are contemporaries and most of the historicals are like the very, very serious books about war stuff. Mm. So I really like both of those types of books. So I just guess I smashed them together <laughs> and made a um, more lighthearted version. Like the past sucks, you know, the real version. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's racism and classism and homophobia and just everything terrible that we still have, but just worse. <laughs> and I wanted to address those things but also have a story with just queer kids getting to have fun and mm -hmm. make friends and uh, fall in love. So mash, mash, just smashed it all together. I don't know. <laughs> so there wasn't like a, a moment or like a idea oh, sure. or like a show or something that sort of like triggered the idea or it just came together. There was. Um, <laughs> I didn't mention that part. <laughs> <laughs> I want to oh. know. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't, like history and I tend to go on these like Wikipedia rabbit hole things where I just dive and read about every king that ever existed in England or something and so somehow I ended up on this rabbit hole where I found out about this drag drag queen named Carol Norman mm. from the 30s and there was this like moment in time where drag got more mainstream in like 1929 to 1931 they called it the pansy craze mm. Mm. adorable Anyway, Carol Norman was fabulous, and he's the reason I gave Marion the name I did. Mary and Leslie, both names are sort of, um, could be androgynous, because Marion and Carol were names that um, were often used for both men and women at the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Carol dr traveled around the country doing drag, and his mom traveled with him and made his glamorous costumes and stuff. I just loved this guy, and <laughs> he's where I got the original idea, and the fact that there the twenties had gotten gradually more open minded and it sort of peaked it with this mm -hmm. drag, drag craze and then the depression hit and there was a conservative backlash. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that is really familiar to my current <laughs> you know, our current situation. Mm -hmm. So that was what really got it, the idea turning. And I don't know why, but Millie, my main character, is just sort of appeared in my brain that she would be this best friend whose aunt owned the speakeasy and <laughs> I've always heard the story in her voice. And Nori is telling me we have an audience question so take that away Noria. <laughs> Thank you Jenna. Hi Kristen. Um, so actually we actually have two questions but they are interconnected. Um, Alexis wants to know if you listen to music while writing and if you did um, or if you do what music were you listening to when you were writing Boy in the Red Dress? And Sarah wants to know um, still talking about music, if you could pick a song to represent like your main characters, what songs would you pick and why would you make that choice? That is a good question. Um, I normally don't listen to a lot of music when I write because I get too distracted. I love singing along with music and <laughs> I still keep meaning to do that thing where you listen to um, like movie soundtracks. Mm. Uh, just uh, instrumental ones. Yes. I think that would be great, but I haven't tried it yet. I keep meaning to. It works. Um, <laughs> yeah. The crescendos and yes. drama. Uh, yeah. I feel like it would work. But mostly I listen to the white, uh, white noise app on my phone and it gets me like in the zone of I am writing now because <laughs> right now I'm procrastinating writing. So I don't turn on my app because that would make me write. It, you know, my brain. It doesn't like to cooperate. During The Boy in the Red Dress, though, I did listen to a lot of 1920s music to get me in the, the mood for it. And there's this band called, um, I don't remember what they're called, <laughs> um, the Shotgun Jazz Band. And I heard them once in New Orleans in uh, The Spotted Cat. And they were had this very old fashioned vibe. They, a guy with that big upright bass thing clunk, clunking on it, you know, and 
Um, so I bought their CD when I was there and I just listened to that on repeat a lot. That's really the only thing I would listen to. It was, that was at the time my trigger, get into the zone, you are writing now about this. As for a song to describe my character or there are a lot of Gershwin songs that I really like mm. that I could use in my book because they were not out of copyright yet. Oh. <laughs> but um, the one I, that's in the book is The Man I Love, and it is out of copyright. Yay. <laughs> just, we like, love that. Got out of it in December, and it's the one I already had in there and I felt like it was perfect, so it was just serendipitous. Love that. It's a cosmic sign. <laughs> yeah. So something I really love about The Boy in the Red Dress is that it's sort of like a reckoning against queer erasure and sort of establishing that queer people have always been here. We just haven't always told their stories. So and it's done in a very fun, sleuthy, suspenseful kind of way. And it's also about seeking queer justice. So I was wondering, were those themes you always wanted to address or did you sort of discover that in the writing process? I think all along, I really was interested in that, but it it did change over the course and got more and more important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked on this book off and on for something like six years. I try not to add it up how long it was because it makes me sad. <laughs> so I don't know exactly. It might be 10 years for all I know and I just haven't blocked I mean, it out. Not, yeah, uh, but initially like uh, my sister's lesbian and I one of my close friends was gay and took me to my first drag show the ones the book is dedicated to and I had lots of queer friends so it was important to me as an issue but over the course of writing it I figured out that I am bisexual (laughs) I did not know before (laughs) love it so it became about me and for me too Mm -hmm. over course so it was a good thing it took so long because it would have been a very different book I mean Millie started out straight (laughs) haha Big mood. <laughs> yeah. Like over time, she didn't even change when I realized she was bisexual. She was exactly the same. She was she was bi all along, like me, and just didn't know. I just didn't know. It's fixed now. <laughs> uh, it does. She does work as your main character really well, though. So I'm glad that she came to celebrate her bi-ness. And I love that. That's at the forefront of the story. We have a nice little sort of bi-love triangle that's really fun to read about. Kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about how like there's no... Um, stories that really kind of fit this same niche as yours. I noticed that on your press kit on your website that there's mentions of comp titles like The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue and Gentleman Jack and Veronica Mars, which are sort of industry shorthand for queer historical fiction and murder mystery. So, but I want to know, were there any seminal titles or authors that were formative for you going into the book? Mostly, I mean, Veronica Mars, I did watch a lot of Veronica Mars before, and Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. I felt like book-wise, there wasn't much that I had to compare it to. Mm. It wasn't very similar. I feel like that sounds arrogant or something to say, my book is different from all the other books. But... (laughs) But I, I don't know, this particular mashup of whatever it is, mm-hmm. I don't, I can't find anything else to comp it to. I and agree. maybe there will be more going forward. Maybe I'll just write some more. <laughs> but I did like Miss Fisher and uh, Veronica Mars. They're both about a woman who is not following the rules, you know, not being polite and um, being nosy mm-hmm. and <laughs> and I'm Southern. I was raised that you're supposed to be polite and not too loud and, you know, all these things that, that I've never been very good at. <laughs> so I wanted to write a character that was also a Southern girl who was super bad at being a Southern girl. <laughs> we do have a question from Melissa, who you know. So she said, what do you wish you knew before you started querying the boy in the red dress? I queried it earlier versions of it. I wish I had not done that (laughs) back when I thought it was not a murder mystery (laughs) and didn't know Millie was by like there were so many things (laughs) that I wish those those versions never went into the world anywhere. Maybe what something surprised you as uh, something that surprised you about being part of the industry that maybe you didn't know before. I I wish that I had been more aware of what I needed Mm -hmm. as a client and as an author once I got the book deal like I think I was too afraid to rock the boat and too afraid to um, ask my questions 
And I think that people should ask questions. And it took me a long time to get to where I would ask for what I needed rather than just hoping it would appear. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely recommend anyone to not be afraid to ask questions. There's been some stuff on Twitter lately about whether to ask, ask, just ask anything you can, anyone you can, anyone you can think of, ask all the things. I think that's good advice because a lot of people don't know what goes on behind the scenes and there's not really like a blueprint for what going into publishing looks like. So I I guess people just assume they don't have a right to ask those questions, but that's good advice. I think that in publishing, it's not like a malicious intent to keep information from you. I think that there are so many little things in this industry that if you're already in it, if you're on the publisher or agent, whatever side of it, you already know all this stuff. It's second nature to you. So you don't, you assume that everyone else does too, but it's not, we don't, <laughs> I didn't know any, I was always asking other author for it. Like, how does it, what should I expect? I don't have an idea. Instead of just asking my editor, it's, it was my own fear. A lot of it, mm-hmm. but, and it wasn't that they were trying to keep things from me at right. all. It right. was just, they didn't know I needed to know it. <laughs> Well, that's good, though, that you have a community of authors that you can turn to and be like, "Mm, is this normal? Like, what am I supposed to do? (laughs) So kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about, like, not being like any other books. (laughs) Um, I know when I brought this book to our Quarantine Pages sessions, a lot of people were very excited about it and really into, like, all the different facets of the story. So what are some books that you would recommend to people who want to read even more stories like yours i know we said there's not a lot out there but you know well i have been told that it's similar to iron cast mm. by destiny Gloria, i think is how you pronounce her name and um i haven't read it yet but i put it on my tbr immediately it's on mine it's on mine yeah so i've heard that one um that's the only one i've really heard it compared to since people have been able to start reading it but i bet some more will surface as more people read it and I'm excited to read more books like it because obviously that's why I wrote it. I really like this. I want books like this. Somebody write them. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have to write them. (laughs) Similarly, Noria asked earlier, do you know of any other books set during the Prohibition era that you would recommend? I know that um, Libba Bray's Diviner series Mm. is set during this and it has some similar vibes. It's just more of the um, supernatural stuff. Like mine doesn't have any supernatural. So, um, Hers, like I read her first one and it really scared me. I'm a big wimp. So. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, there's like devils in this. I'm too scared. So, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I've heard that one's like really creepy. So I haven't like you're easily in. terrified like me. Then <laughs> maybe not that one. But, but otherwise it was really fun before oh, it got. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> so I wanted to know, are there any future works on the horizon that you can share with us and will they be in the same vein as the boy in the red dress or will they be something completely different oh my cat's here (laughs) i would write sequels to this book all my life forever if i was given the chance i love these characters and i want to write about them forever but no one has given me that opportunity yet Oh no i want the sequel (laughs) yeah Listen, publisher people, people want the sequel. I want it um, to happen. I don't think it's ruled out or anything. And just, you know, everybody's cautious. They want to find out if anyone wants to read this book yet before they give me more money. Maybe one day. And I have a spinoff idea with um, Sharp, the reporter, being the star of the a book. I love her. So. I She's basically love myself, that. third character. <laughs> so would it be like another murder mystery or... If she did get a spinoff, all this is off the record, by the way. <laughs> this is not official. Yeah, totally unofficial. Uh, yeah, I, I would do a murder mystery and, of course, bring in all the other folks because she'd be like, well, I know this this chick, Millie, who knows how to solve mysteries. Let me go see what she's up to. And so yes. I, I love that idea and I want to do it really bad. So maybe I will. But my thing I'm working on now is a middle grade and really different. It's also a mystery, but... It's set in like a secretive Disney-esque park, Ooh. amusement park, and the kids have to, um, these two cousins have to go behind the scenes to try to find their missing tour guide slash one of them's mom. I've been to Disney World like a bunch of times. 
I want to use my Disney knowledge for for good. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. I'm so glad you said that because I was about to be like, would you ever consider writing for another demographic? And it's like, middle, middle grade is my heart. So I my, I, my children are seven and nine. So we read tons of middle grade together. And I've been reading a lot of my fellow debuts, middle grades, and they are so I just love them so much. I really do. They have so much heart and ugh, I could just cry. I love them. Okay, now I'm like, now I'm like, what are your middle grade recs? Like, let's live in this moment. I just read um, Anna on the Edge. Yes. Oh my God. I'm so excited for that one. It is so good. Like, it was so good. Oh my God. I'm ready. I can't even. <laughs> I'm bad at reviews because I just get like, I don't know, just read it. But it, it was so good. It made me cry. Of course, all books make me cry. I cry all, a lot. But <laughs> but it was suspenseful too. And it's about figure skating. So it's and I don't care about sports at all, but I was like in it. <laughs> I didn't know what's going to happen. Invested. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because I'm super hyped about that one. Nori said someone asked, um, if you couldn't get the sequel or spinoff published, would you consider self-publishing it? I don't know how feasible that is, but... I don't either, but, you know, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> There's no telling what I will do. <laughs> I don't know what my future is at any given moment, so... <laughs> That's I'm fair. Trying to, I'm just hoping that I can still write books. I think it, this happens to a lot of people. It's like you forget how to write books in between everyone. <laughs> And I've had a lot of intentional, semi-intentional procrastination going on this year. I've decided to buy a house that had to be completely renovated from the ground up. This is my house that I live in. And the other house, that's where my other, that's where my June Her book is that I've been reading. So that's why I had to read my this instead. <laughs> so for six months, that's all I've been, you know, I get tend to get obsessed with something like a creative, creatively. Like I taught, taught myself to sew one time for six months. And I just did not to sew for six months. Well, I need to take a gift. And so now the house has been my six month creative, creative energy suck. But it's almost done. And I'm very excited about that. Yay. So I, because I want to write again, I miss it. Mm. My little scraps that I've done all along are not good enough. I need to just dive in. Yeah. Something. Noria says she has a question for you. So Noria, I'm going to let you ask that yourself. <laughs> okay hi Kirsten hi. Um, so I, I was curious right because you've expressed your love for Nancy Drew which I, I read a lot of Nancy Drew growing up so I felt that so hard um, the same thing with the Miss Fisher Modern Mystery and you know the way in which they call like writers to like add to the stories by writing their own interpretation and writing a new book so if you have the chance to write a Nancy Drew book that will be added to the Nancy Drew collection or a Miss Fisher murder mystery? Which of these two would you choose? Hard choice. Can I just do both? I, don't, I can't choose. <laughs> that sounds amazing. If they would ask me to do that, I would be like, yes, <laughs> for sure. Yes. For either one of those. Miss, I, it, they're so different. Like Miss Fisher, she gets to do sexy times and stuff. So. <laughs> So that's fun. I haven't got to write any sexy times yet. I was going to say, like, would you ever consider doing maybe adults or do you feel like you're kind of settled in for younger readers? I'm not ruling it out, but, um, and I read a lot of adult myself, so I probably could, but since I'm so interested in the murder thing, <laughs> um, a lot of adult books are a lot darker than I want to go. You know, the victims... The victim in my book is a woman as well, but the level of violence in adult m murder mysteries, I can read it, but I don't think I could dwell in that mm. long enough to read it, to write it. I have two daughters and I don't know, it gets under my skin too much when I read this stuff. So I'm not sure if I'd be able to write an adult murder mystery, though I have daydreams about it whenever I read one of those really twisty ones where there's, everybody's got the secrets and you're like, what is their secret? Who's the kid? I need to know all the secrets. <laughs> like the show Broadchurch on Netflix. Mm, I've heard of it, yes. Yeah, I got real obsessed with that. <laughs> and I recently watched uh, the first season of uh, Twin Peaks. I'd never watched it before, and I was like, I need to know everything. <laughs> kind of like going off that, like even if it's not a direct fluence, influence, like um, are there any shows or other media that you feel kind of like 
work their way into your writing process. Definitely shows like Broad Church mm -hmm. where um, something that I figured out in your question earlier about how to write a mystery, basically, <laughs> I studied a bunch of mysteries and sh mystery shows. I looked up the Edgar Awards list. It's mm. the big mystery award and read several of the books on it and made notes in them and put lots of sticky notes in them and figured out that the only thing these books and shows all have in common is that everyone in them has a secret. Yes. So then they all have a reason to lie. Mm -hmm. And so everyone looks suspicious. I was like, this is it. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> what did that research list look like? Like what were some of the titles that you went through? There was one called The Virgin of Small Plains, I think. I remember mm -hmm. that one. I don't know. But basically every book on my shelf that was a mystery as well, I went and tagged and paid attention to and I would watch whole movies while writing down like the beats of the movie and but that was pretty much a waste of time <laughs> <laughs> but the dedication it's there <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. also I um have a subscription to the archives of the New Orleans newspapers so I did a lot of reading those they were extremely useful because mm. I did a lot of like what happens in prohibition when someone gets arrested or when a cl club gets raided? What even happens? I couldn't find that out. I read so many books about prohibition. <laughs> find out what happens? When can they open up? Do they have to move somewhere else? What do they do? And the newspapers were super useful for that because they would tell you everybody's business. They told you <laughs> back then, they would tell you everyone's full name and their address. Mm -hmm. You like the victims of crimes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, old newspapers are wild. <laughs> I once found one that had like it had my grandparents name and like where they lived and it just like so and so like threw a birthday party for their kids on this day of this week and it's like okay <laughs> okay but I guess it's useful that's a good good resource for you I guess as a historical writer I don't know if that was the answer to your original question but <laughs> I don't even know what the original question was what do you know, my inspirations from other books and influences oh yes um, i just know i really like all the books with where everybody has a secret and that make you keep turning those pages even like and on the edge or other books that have suspense suspense is just like my bread and butter i just love it so <laughs> i agree and that's really what holds every book together is you know what's going to happen next what's going to happen with these characters that kind of thing so those are all the questions i had for you so to sort of wrap up uh do you have any events coming up where can people find you on the internet and get updates about your work uh not really any events because here we are but mm -hmm. uh and things, you know, are popping up kind of randomly. So I don't know what's going to be happening, but <laughs> watch my social media to find out. Um, I'm at Kristen L. Writes on both Instagram and Twitter. And my website is KristenLambertWrites.com. And it's Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That concludes our conversation. And I uh, will follow up with you and hopefully we can collaborate again in the future. I hope so. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It was fun chatting with you.